Amen. Well, the title of the message this uh, afternoon is Easy be Believism o Creer Fácil, just so you guys understand where we're getting because that, that's not common, but Easy Believism, and, and uh, we have some Spanish speakers in the audience, but they understand English, but that's not a very common term. Easy Believism is not a license to sin. Easy Believism is not a license to sin, and you know, every once in a while you have to preach messages based on what you're dealing with in the local church or in our local area and you know one of the challenges that we face here in uh, Houston is the fact that whenever we're out so winning one of the major objections is the fact that you know this is too easy or it's easy believism and that almost sounds like it's a license to sin and so I'm going to address that today and just what the Bible has to say about easy believism and what it has to say about having a license to sin. You know, when you go, you know, when I, last year I traveled quite a bit uh, to some of these conferences and you face different challenges when you're soul winning. So for example, when I went to Detroit, you know, we, we ran into a lot of uh, black Hebrew roots uh, individuals. And then when I went to uh, Atlanta, there was a lot of repent of your sin individuals when we were door knocking. Uh, then at the end of the year, I went to Chandler, Arizona. And uh, a lot of the opposition there was uh, just New Age, uh, Gnosticism, or not believing in Jesus, or just not interested, or not caring. But here in Houston, and in our local community, specifically here in Spring Branch, when we're out soul winning, and more specific even to the Hispanic community, one of the challenges we run into is that Hispanics don't like easy believism. You know, they just, they want to know that they did something to earn the salvation that they believe on Jesus Christ, but, or that they, you know, Jesus plus, as, as uh, some people have referred to it. And, and where I'm focused on right there is if you'll go to Romans 5.12, uh, the, where I'm going to focus on for today is, you know, in, in that verse that says, Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. And so we see a couple of things here. The first thing we see is that uh, man, by one man, and that, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So the reason that we, we are uh, appointed to die once physically, and if we don't believe on Jesus Christ eternally, is because Adam sinned. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so the challenge that people have is that, you know, they, they're, they're like, well, you know, when you give me this easy believism or this, uh, this gospel message that's clear, it's just on believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Well, the only challenge is, you know, what about the murderers and what about the thieves and what about the burglars and rapists and all these people? But the Bible says, for all have sinned. You know, we, we know Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They, they, they neglect that word all. All means you and me, even if I don't murder, even if I don't uh, steal and I don't commit fraud, you know, I am all included. I'm all men and I have sinned. We've all sinned. And then verse 13 says, for into the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. And that word imputed is just it's not credited to. And so we see that uh, sin is from the beginning, from Adam. And, and we're going to go through that. So the, but before we do all that, first of all, you know, the, the first thing we probably need to understand is who did all the work. There was work necessary for salvation, but it was not our work. It was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we go there, go to, to Genesis 3, and we're going to be in verse 9. Go to the book of Genesis, and we're going to be in Genesis 3, and go to the uh, Genesis 3, verse 9, and we'll be reading from verse 9, for uh, those of you following, through verse 22. It's quite a bit of scripture, but I think it's important to cover everything. And in Genesis 3, verse 9, it says, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And this is after Adam and Eve had eaten of the, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he said, and he said, I heard thy voice in thy garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, who told thee 
that thou was naked. So the first problem is now they know that they're naked. And at the end of Genesis 2, uh, verse 24 and 25, let's just, uh, let me read that for you. You don't have to turn there. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So even though they were naked, they didn't know that they were ashamed. It wasn't until they sinned and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they knew. And it says in verse 12, and it said, the Bible says, And the man said, The woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And all, immediately we see the first problem. And that's always the problem with an unclear gospel message is that we want to put the blame or the credit on someone other than ourselves. So uh, we want to blame somebody else for our sin, but we want to take the credit for our salvation. You know, it's always like it's all about me. You know, instead of Adam owning up to the problem, what did he do? He immediately blamed uh, the woman. And the Lord said unto uh, the woman, what is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon the belly shalt thou go, and dust, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel." Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall, have, and he shall rule over thee. And I mean, honestly, we, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff here, and I, I encourage you to read it thoroughly, but let's focus on the, on the task at hand. It says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow thou eat it all the days, uh, and thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto um, forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And then let's focus on verse 21 and 22 says, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and, and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So a couple of challenges we see here is the very first thing is, you know, God did the work, and we see a foreshadow or a picture of Jesus Christ in verse 21. Who covered Adam and Eve correctly? Who covered them in the blood? Who covered their shame? God did. And we know that Jesus was in the beginning because the Bible tells us in John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And right there it says, And unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. You know, how do you get coats of skin? You have to kill an animal. There has to be bloodshed. Now, this is the blood that doesn't cover the sin because the blood of goats doesn't cover sin, but this is the foreshadowing or the picture of what Jesus Christ would do for us ultimately on that cross. We see it from the very beginning because, see, Adam and Eve, they weren't even, they, they didn't, they were so new to the concept of sin, they didn't even know how to cover themselves. They took fig trees, you know, I mean, uh, fig leaves and, and twigs and then just covered themselves in trees. And God said, no, this is the proper way because I have to cover your shame. And, and then uh, verse 22 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. See, this is a challenge. We want to be like God, but we can't understand what God understands. See, God created good and evil, but God's ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But for us, it became a problem. It became a problem into, unto death. And then, he obviously, He removed them from the garden so that they wouldn't live forever under that penalty. Now, the only way we are condemned to live forever under that penalty if we don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me just say from the very beginning, the reason I point out who did all the work is because Jesus did all the work because from the very beginning, the only thing that we did create is the, the nature or the right born into to sin. I'm not saying we have a right to sin, but we are born 
we're uh, conceived in iniquity or in sin. And so what happens as our children grow and as we grew, we grew into an accountable age where we fall into our sin nature. Our, our flesh is constantly warring with the spirit. So when people ask me now, you know, you, it used to be that when people say, oh, you know, you believe in easy belie believism and you're, oh, what you're saying is that's a license to sin. And I always, t I always tell them, no, you don't really need a license to sin. I mean, what I always, what I, what I didn't used to tell them, but now I tell them is it's not that we have a license to sin. We're sinners already. You're not going to stop doing what you're doing. If anything, the only reason that we improve our lives is because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that my sin nature is not there. You know, if you've done some sin in the past and now you're saved by grace and you're avoiding it or you don't do that sin, guess what? You're always susceptible to that temptation. You're always weak to that. And there's certain sins that maybe you've never committed that you're maybe a little bit stronger. But guess what? Those temptations exist anyways. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, you know, and, and the, the problem is that nobody wants to accept the fact, or I mean, I shouldn't say nobody, the majority of people don't want to accept the fact that it's all on the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to prove that to you here uh, in, in a couple of minutes. But the other thing that we see here is, let me just first give you, so the first thing is, who did all the work? Well, all the work was done by Jesus. And he, he even foreshadowed it by, you know, the killing of goats and covering them up and creating coats and skin to cover them. But the, the second thing we need to understand is, do we have to get a license to sin? Well, what is a license? Well, according to just the dictionary definition, a license is an official permission or permit to do, use, or own something, as well as the document of that permission or permit. A license can be granted by a party to another party as an element of an agreement between those parties. A shorthand definition of a license is an authorization to use licensed material. In particular, a license may be issued by authorities to allow an activity that would otherwise be forbidden, right? It may require paying a fee or proving a capability. The requirement also serve to keep the authorities informed on the type of activity. La 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 la. But basically, the the uh, when people argue that easy believism or believing on Christ alone is a license to sin is is dumb because God would never give you a license to sin. I mean, it's not like we we fill out a paperwork and be like, hey. You know, here I am, God, here's my paperwork, my date of birth, my name. Here's the sins that I want to commit. These are the sins that I like to avoid. Uh, you know, here's the fee. Can I please have my license? No. I mean, my daughter is uh, now two and a half or something. Uh, you know, I don't know all the months, but she's like two and a half. She'll be three here pretty soon. And uh, the other day we were talking about, uh, we were sitting down and she was eating her French fries. And I took a French fry and I ate it and she said, Daddy, don't eat my fries. And I said, no, well, Daddy buys the fries. You know, I get, I'm, uh, we're, we learn to share. So then she said, well, fries are yucky. Don't eat fries, they're yucky. Basically, she lied to me about the state of the fries so that I wouldn't take her fries anymore. And I, I went ahead and I, I scolded her and I said, look, we don't lie. You know, we don't make up stuff. The fries are good. You just need to learn to share. But who taught her to lie? You know, I have not spent any time coaching my daughter how to lie. I, I didn't sit there and give her a lesson on, on lying 101. That's number one. Number two, she didn't come to me and ask me for a license or the authority to lie. No, it's in our nature because of the fall of Adam. The Bible tells us, for by one man's sin. Let's go back and, and read that. Verse 12 of Romans 5 says, for, Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, and when it talks about all men, it talks about everybody, man, woman, child, for that all have sinned. Now, just to clear that up, when we say child, I'm talking about a child in the age of accountability. We, we know from the Bible that, you know, if children are, uh, especially babies, if, if, they, uh, if they die, they go to heaven. And we're not going to talk about that, but if you just go to the book of, uh, if you just go to the story of David when he loses his child for the sin that he committed with Bathsheba, you know, he said, I'm going to him. But that's just a, another side point. But uh, go over to 1 Corinthians 15 and keep your finger there in Romans 5 while I, uh, while I read to you Genesis 2 and 20. And I already read it, but I'm going to read it again. Genesis 2 and verses uh, 24 and 25 and then Genesis 3. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his mother, his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. 
And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. So the first thing is, it wasn't like that from the beginning. If you see that, they weren't ashamed because God created them in the, in the perfect state. But the devil deceived them, and then we see that that changed everything. In verse 17 of Genesis 3, it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, thou shalt not eat of it, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of the life. And basically, it's a, it's what he's saying is it's a corruptible condition. It's in a condition of decay. You know, when we're born, we're born into a state of, of the end goal. The only thing we do know, we're predestined to die at some point. It is appointed a man to die once and then the judgment, right? It, how do you die? Well, you have to die by decay. You have to die by corruption. It has to waste away. You know, the older I get, the more pains and aches I get, the, the, more it, the longer it takes me to recover from, from uh, you know, rigorous activity or from hard work. Why? Because my body is decaying. It's not in the same state it was when I was 20 years old or 15 years old. You know, if I, uh, just, before this, uh, just before the sermon today, I ate a small piece of cake. And so I got a little, I'm not tired up here, but it, it was shortly before, you know, 20, 30 minutes after, you feel the sugar rush. When I was 15, man, I could eat a, the whole cake, nothing had happened. You know, I could probably be up all night and get to go. Why? Because my body's in a state of decay. It's not going to be sad about. It's just the facts of life. You know, that's what happens. I don't need a license to know that I'm decaying. I, don't, I didn't go and ask somebody, hey, can I please have permission to waste away and die <laughs> in, in my body? But the one thing I do know is that my soul is preserved in all eternity because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? Romans 5.12 and you're in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, but Romans 5, 12 again says, For Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I'm going to drive that point in, because, you know, it's not a license to sin. Easy believism is truly what it is. And, I, and actually, I believe, I'd like to call it simple believism. Because in, in life, if, if everything was easy, then everybody do it. Meaning, you know, it makes sense that everybody would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the challenge is that I think it's more of a simple believism in the sense that we know what we need to do to preach the gospel. We know People know once they get the gospel what they can do to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's the sin nature, it's the fact that we're a fallen state that impedes us from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ 100% of the time. You know, I've gone through an entire presentation with someone, and I mean, they're like, they understand that they're sinners and that they understand that their penalty for sin is, is uh, hell and that it's death and they understand that it's eternal and they understand it's a free gift and they understand that Jesus paid it all and they understand all of that and then you get to the end and you're like, well, what I like to do is guide you in a, in a prayer that'll, that'll settle that today. And I'm like, the prayer doesn't save, but if you believe the words that you pray, they save. And then, like, would you like to pray with me or let's pray together? And I mean, they just stop you dead on your tracks. And I'm like, well, what's, what's holding you back? Well, I'm not ready. Well, the Bible says today's the day of salvation. You already understand everything. I don't know. I just need to get some things right. There's nothing to get right. God got it right for you when he sent his son Jesus to die for you. Yeah, I just don't know. And it doesn't matter how much you plead and you pull and you fight. They're just not there. Why? Because all have sinned. You know, we've all fallen. It, we've all got into that state. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 19. It says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all are of all men most miserable. You know, the, that's a great verse because it says, Look, if, if, if you only had this life to believe in Christ and there was nothing else to hope for, we would be miserable. But we're not because we know that when we believe in Christ, when we hope in Christ, we have eternal life. It's forever. It says, but now in Christ, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of, dead, uh, of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. See, there is no license, there is no excuse, it's simple. Jesus paid it all. 
Jesus Christ is the only reason that you're made alive, that you're quickened, that you're given that freedom, that eternal peace, that perpetual peace, that peace that passes all understanding. It says, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ that is coming. And I mean, it's, it's just a great, we, we really need to get into the Word and the Scripture when we do these, when we're going so when we're trying to battle these uh, false prophets or these false uh, belief systems because there's a lot of information out there people go and search information you know I just typed into Google easy believism just to see what pops up and you know everybody has an opinion and nobody gives you God's word completely they're just giving you what their opinion is and I wanted to show you I mean I went to two websites one was got called gotquestions.com and I think the other one was a uh, it's a popular website that I'm not uh, uh, a fan of I forget that what the acronym starts for, but it's C-A-R-M or CARM or something like that. Here's one of the articles. I'm not going to read everything to you, but I'm just going to point out where people get it wrong. And it's always tied to work. And it's always tied to how I can prove to God that I should be in heaven when the reality is the only reason that we live. What did it say in verse 22 of uh, 1 Corinthians? For as, all in Adam, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made uh, alive. And so we see here, uh, the question is, is easy belie believism a license to sin? So a couple of things that stand out. The title of my message is nothing new under the sun. The Bible says there's not anything new under the sun. It's not like I'm coming up with some concept that, you know, by the way, that's a really good sign of a false prophet or a false preacher. If they read the Bible and they think they figured out something that we haven't figured out in the past two 2,000 years or, you know, since the Bible was finished shortly after Jesus Christ, the complete Bible, the whole Word of God. Because the reality is we're all going to preach the same thing until the end of time. You know, there's 66 books. We can get a lot of sermons, probably thousands of sermons, but eventually we're all going to just kind of recycle the same information. That's the way the Word should be preached. There's only one message, and it's the message of Jesus Christ through the King James Bible for us that speak uh, English and maybe in Spanish it's the Reina Valera, but you know in whatever language there's only one Bible, one word, because thy word is truth, right? But here this guy is saying, no, being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that without works is not a license to sin. Quite the contrary, in true biblical salvation, there's also the necessary experience of regeneration that goes along with salvation. Let me let me stop right there. There is not a necessary experience of Jesus Christ in your spirit regenerates you. The Holy Spirit does the work. There is a change, but it's a supernatural change. It doesn't require you to change. It doesn't require you to be better. It doesn't require you to do anything other than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have to do anything besides that, then there's works attached to it. So they're already wrong there. And this is what people read. These are popular websites. I'm not just, you know, I didn't go and search some obscure thing. These are places where they pop up first or second on Google. People have thousands of, you know, probably millions of hits on them. And then they get confused about the salvation message. It says, regeneration is the work of God where he changes the person from being enslaved to sin to serving God. What do you mean? enslaved to sin to serving God. Look, we're still in the flesh. That means that I'm still a slave to sin. The only time I don't sin now in my uh, righteousness through Jesus Christ is when I'm in the spirit. But I'm not in the spirit 100% because I still have a corruptible flesh that wars with that. There's always that, 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 uh, that war there. Go to, Romans, uh, go to Romans 7, just a few pages over. Go to Romans 7 and go to verse uh, uh, 21 and then verse 22. So look, I'm saved. This is what happens because I'm saved. I find, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. In other words, inside in my spirit, man, I, I love the word of God. And I really do. When I read the word in the spirit, man, there's just a, it's good stuff. But then what does verse 23 say? But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, right? Enslavement, if, if I wanted to change that word just for the sake of this article I'm reading, of sin, which is in my members. So see, you I mean, we're still fighting with that captivity of the flesh. The, the guy goes on to say here, uh, 
you know, God, regeneration is the work where he changes the person from being a slave to, uh, to sin, to serving God, from being dead in his sins, to alive in Christ, from not being indwelt by God, and to, to being indwelt by God. This is what it means to be born again and to be a new creature in Christ. So when people accuse Christians who affirm that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as a license to go out and sin, they are misrepresenting the position and bearing false witness, false witness against it. Furthermore, they are ignoring the fact that true Christians also regenerate, which mot motivates them to stop sinning, to war against their sin, and to honor God. That's in complete contradiction to what these verses say. See, this is dangerous because people believe that they can lose their salvation. This is dangerous because people think they're better than those that believe on Jesus Christ. You know, we went door knocking in a nice neighborhood today, and I, I truly believe the Lord sent these two guys that were out on the street because everybody we knocked on, no thank you, no, I'm not interested. Oh, I go to church already. They're not interested because they think that they're better. But then we ran into some, to two Hispanic guys that were just happened to walk through that neighborhood going to uh, probably their apartment complex or whatever. We gave them the gospel, and they got it. It was simple. I said, look, if in five years or in two years uh, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have eternity, and all of a sudden, because I could tell they were Catholic because one of them was wearing that, the Catholics wear a necklace that, uh, with a leather thing. I don't know what it means, but th this very Catholic thing. They, wear, they love to wear wet nether, uh, leather necklaces. So I said, well, what if in two three, two, three years after you've been saved or after you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you kill yourself? Oh, man, I'm going to hell. Why? You're not supposed to kill yourself. I mean, that, that condemns you to hell. And I, and I said, well, what did the Bible say? And I took him back to the verses. And I said, creer, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I took him to another verse. Creer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, I said, okay, now what does the Bible say? Just believe, not believe and, and not kill yourself, not believe and go to church, not believe and go be a person, just believe. And then at the end, he got it, both of them, uh, his, Marcelo, Marcelino, and Miguel. They both got it. But if they would have read this and then come to me and I would have given them the Bible, they would have fought with me because they thought this guy would know better than God. See, this guy thinks he knows better than God. Man thinks they know better than God. That's the problem with uh, Adam and Eve, right? They thought they, they could be like God if they just took of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Uh, here's another one. This is a long one, so I'm not going to read it all, so don't worry. We're going to get out of here in time. But there's a couple of things. It says, what is easy believism? So these guys are like trying to answer this question, and they're giving you all this information, and then this thing, this thing here says, uh, however, and this is talking about proof of, Salvation is that it's on faith alone. If you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, look, if somebody says that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have to take them at their word until I'm proven otherwise. I'm not God. I don't know their hearts. Now, the Bible gives us clear instruction. We can figure out how to spot false teachers and maybe Judases and, and, and bad people in the church, but it doesn't give us a perfect formula. In other words, because I'm not God and I can't see everybody, I'm not always going to know who is saved and who's not. But the one thing that I have to take at, at, uh, at its word or at uh, I mean, the, 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 the colloquialism eludes me right now, but what the one thing that I have to actually is the Bible says it's by faith alone. So if somebody comes to me and says, look, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I ask them the questions, they give me the right answers. Whether I like that person, or I get a bad feeling, or I don't, they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're saved. Now, every once in a while, Judas Iscariot was with the 12 apostles. He was a devil, but if you look at the proportionate number, it was 11 to 1. So it's not always going to be like that. God tells us that the tares are among the wheat. We know that's going to happen, but that's not the case all the time. So for us, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. These guys, however, say that that's not the case. They're like, oh, well, you know, we believe that it's all by faith alone. However, that is not what sola fide means. And then they use some weird term. It says true faith. I mean, they're using Latin. They could have just said faith alone. It means the same thing. True faith in Christ will always lead to a changed life. Now, that's a lie from the devil. If you just go over a few pages to Romans 4, Verses 4 and 5, it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of dead. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted 
for righteousness. If you don't work, meaning, look, when I got saved, I didn't work for Christ. And then after I got saved, guess what? I still didn't work. When I first got saved, my, the first few years of my life, actually, I think I, my sin life, actually, I, I think the devil tempted me more. And I, I don't know if I got worse or if I stayed in the same state. It was, it didn't, like, there was nothing, my life didn't seem to change other than I knew I had perpetual peace. It wasn't until I actually started reading the Bible, like the Bible says, and I started going to church more regularly, and I started attending and learning and discipling and working with others and being mentored that all of a sudden I started to try to, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this, and this is a bad thing for my life, and I want the rewards, and I want the crowns of life, and the crowns of righteousness, and the crown of, I don't know that I'm actually asking for the crown of the martyr. If I, ha if I get it, you know, well, then I get it. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is that's, that's the, the change that comes after if you do these things. But it's not necessary. Verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Then later on, this guy goes to say, We are his servants. And from the moment of salvation by faith, we embark on a journey of preordained good works that are evidence of that salvation. What? That's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, those two guys walked away from us. I didn't see any outward evidence of salvation. I just asked them a few questions. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what the Bible says. I, I mean, I didn't ask them to, I mean, I didn't say, hey, if you don't go to church today at 5 o'clock, you're not saved, and guess what? Now you're going to go to hell. I didn't, or if you don't get baptized, or if you don't read the Bible, you know, none of that. It says, if there is no evidence of growth and good works, we have reason to doubt the salvation ever truly took place. I mean, that's a slap in God's face in His Word. Then they say, faith alone doesn't mean that some believers follow Christ in a life of discipleship, while others do not. And, and go back to Romans 7, right there in verse 22. And, uh, tw I mean, verse 23. And uh, we're going to read 23 and 24. Because this guy says uh, here, that all of a sudden, what the term that they give them is that they become carnal Christians. Let me tell you something. We're all carnal Christians. If you believe in Jesus Christ, in the spirit, you're in a, uh, in the spirit, you're righteous. But in the flesh, you're carnal. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. It says right there, uh, let's go back to 21. It says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. What are you, what's the war? The flesh. The carnal flesh. The, l the lust of the flesh, it says, uh, and bringing me into captivity, bringing into captivity the law of sin which is in my members, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, another word for flesh is carnal, the law of sin. So that's a carnal Christian right there, because with the mind... With the spirit, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. In other words, it's con it's, they're both, you know, it's, a, it's an oxymoron, but that's how it works until we get to heaven. We're not, we haven't taken on the incorruptible flesh. We're in the incorruptible spirit. It says, uh, and then, you know, he goes on to say a bunch of stuff, and it, it doesn't really matter. So we don't need a license because we're all sinners. We don't. And it's important for us to understand that because as we go out and soul win in this area, it seems like, you know, birds of a feather flock together. And since there's a lot of charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches and Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists and Mormons, you know, you're going to get all these people that say, oh, yeah, I believe on Jesus Christ. Okay, great. Yeah, but if you blaspheme the, whole, blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you know, you're going to go to hell. Well, you can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost if you're saved by grace. I mean, it's just that simple. So let's go, go to Psalm 51. We'll close out here uh, shortly. Go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 in the Old Testament, right about the middle. Psalm 51. We're going to go down to verse seven, 1 through 7. It says, uh, 51, 1 through 7. Psalm 51. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him, after he had gone into 
Bathsheba, have mercy upon me, O God, according to the, thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. This is David. David was a man after God's own heart and he knows the state he's in. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. You know, why are we sinful? Because Adam was, he's the father of all generations. And in that sin, it says, our mothers conceived us. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom, the inward man. Perch me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Who washes you? Jesus. They didn't say, David didn't say, I figured out I'm a sinner, and it's easy but I can also live a better life. No, he's like, look, I, I'm the, my sin is ever before me. There's, it's, like, it's like you're walking into the sin, not that you're just like figuring out what sin not to do or not to. The more you walk into, there's always challenges. There's always roadblocks. There's always stumbling blocks. You're walking into it. There's no way to avoid that action. There's no way to avoid that consequence. I mean, at some point in your life, you're going to sin. Now, can we improve our life? Can we, uh, you know, I'm not going out there and murdering people, but guess what? I lie quite a bit, you know. I'm not saying I'm a liar. I'm just saying that's a simple uh, accusation that you can make on yourself is we all lie at some point in our lives. You know, I've lied in my past. I've probably lied recently, and it'd be really hard for me to say that I'm not going to lie in the future because then I'd probably be a liar right now. You know, I'm not, just, by the way, if people say, well, that, oh, that guy's a liar, you should listen. I'm just, that's good. You probably shouldn't listen to me. Listen to the Word of God and scrutinize everything I say. Go to uh, Numbers 15. Go to Numbers 15, and I'll read for you Isaiah 1.18, and I'll read for you also Ecclesiastes. And Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says the same thing that we hear in Romans, and Solomon said it, it says, For there's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And the reason I like going to the Old Testament sometimes because people try to separate out, oh, that was the Old Testament, this is the New Testament. Look, my sin is ever before me, for there's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. If you go to Romans 3.10, for there's not one righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Numbers 15 says, uh, Go to verse 22 of Numbers 15, and I'm going to go through a set of uh, uh, sins, and, it, and you're going to notice a, a very important word that we're going to be covering here. It says, And if ye have erred and not observed all these commandments which the Lord hath spoken unto Moses, even all that the Lord hath commanded you by the hand of Moses, from the day that the Lord commanded Moses, and henceforth among your generations, then it shall be, if ought be committed by ignorance... Without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregations should offer you, offer one bullock for a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord with meat, with his meat offering and his drink offering according to the manner of, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel and shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance. And they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin off offering before the Lord for their ignorance. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourneth among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. And if the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly, when he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. Ye shall have one law, for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel, for the stranger that sojourneth among them, but the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he is born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. 
because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. If you notice the theme there, it was ignorance. Guess what? We don't need a license to sin. And don't be so self-righteous to think that just because you don't murder, because you don't steal, and because you don't commit fraud. And I'm not talking, I mean, there's people that murder and, and steal and commit fraud. But those that act like all self-righteous, that they're not sinning. Because guess what? The Bible says that you're, you're, you're ignorant of some of your sins. That's very clear here. I mean, I think he was pretty repetitive to drive the point home that sometimes you sin in ignorance. So there's stuff that I've done that I just, I'm ignorant to. Thank God that the blood of Jesus. But what did he say? For those that presumptuously, meaning premeditatedly sin, they're cut off. And I mean, we're talking later to those after Jesus Christ that actually reject him. There is a doctrine that we preach. It's called the reprobate doctrine, where if uh, there comes a point where you can reject the Lord Jesus for the final time. And then you're cut off and you no longer have an opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're condemned already and you, you remain condemned. That's a, I'm not going to preach that message right now. But there's something to be said about how the Old Testament ties to the New Testament. It's all God's word. Go to Romans 8 and we'll close out. Go to Romans 8. And it's not because, you know, we don't, I mean, we have the law to remind us that we're sinners. But, and in, in Jesus Christ died to fulfill the law of the, pro, the law. But if we go to Romans 8.1, there's something specific about the law that I want to focus on right here. It says, Therefore there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Basically, the carnal Christian who has to say, you know, at the, I'm not going to walk after the flesh, but the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit, if you look, pay attention to that verse, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. See, it's not that there isn't a law, but the law, remember Jesus came to fulfill the law. He is. It says it's the law of the Spirit. Once we're in the Spirit, that's the law we're going to follow. Unfortunately, and we're made free. That's why we're able to abound. That's why God's able to purge us so that we can reap more fruit, so that we can sow more seeds, so that we can go out there and, and preach the gospel. But it's only when we're free from what law? The law of sin and death. Because the challenge is that we, now the only law that, that, that uh, commands our attention is the law of the corruptible death. We're going to die in our bodies, but we're no longer subject to the law of sin and death, you know, the spiritual death. Or as the Bible describes later on as in Revelation, when it's all said and done, the second death, right? Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. What, what, how's the only way to beat the law? How's the only way to beat sin? Through Jesus Christ. Because death cannot conquer Christ. He conquered death. It says, For that righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. See, you guys are here tonight, and what's interesting is we say we're a Christian nation. The pew should be filled to the brim. But you know why they're not? Because it's February 3rd and it's Super Bowl Sunday. And people are minding the things of the flesh. And like I said earlier this morning, the only thing that should give you peace is that if there's people watching the Super Bowl today that accepted Jesus Christ, at least they're going to heaven. Now, my prayer would be that we'd have some hard preachers to get them out of that so that they could walk in the spirit more than they walk in the flesh. But it's not necessary for salvation. You know, you don't have to be in church tonight to be saved, but you're in church tonight because you want to walk in the spirit. It says, for, they, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. I mean, it's active opposition against God. People say, oh, well, it's a license to sin. And if, what if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then I reject him? And I tell people, I mean, if you sin, you reject God. The Bible says when you're in the carnal mind, you're in enmity with God. Guess what? When I sin this week, 
I meant enmity with God. I better get in the spirit quick. I better ask God for forgiveness. I better know that he's going to chastise me. I better know that he's going to fix that. He's going to whoop me proverbially, right? It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, because, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And then verse 8, and we'll close out with that. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Go to Hebrews 11 real quick. Hebrews 11. This wasn't part of the message, but we'll tie it together. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, but without faith, you know what? Let's just go to verse 1 and read it through 6. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For, it by, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it uh, he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God hath translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek, uh, seek him. Verse 8 of Romans 8 says, so that, they cannot, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. See, you can't please God when you're in sin. The only way you can please God is to be in the Spirit. And the only way to get the Spirit is to believe on Jesus Christ through faith alone. And we'll close out in that because I think that's a perfect uh, way to close it out. I don't usually have such a wonderful, easy ending, but that, that made perfect sense. So let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today and the opportunity to preach a message like this. This message uh, was just, it's been burrowing in my heart for a couple of weeks now as we go out soul winning, we keep running into this. And uh, it's, it's a local message. You know, I know we, we post these things on YouTube and I, and I pray that it helps anybody else who's facing these challenges but the reality is that you know I hope it's good instruction for those of us that are out there every day uh, or every week I'm sorry and every possible day soul winning and uh, facing these oppositions that we can overcome this challenge by understanding that it's through faith alone we don't have a license to sin because we're sinners already you know that as while we were yet sinners Christ died for us well I'm yet a sinner I'm still a sinner so thank you Lord for uh, that opportunity to preach a message, and I pray that any, in anywhere that I made a mistake, that your word uh, overrides and that, that that would be the final authority. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.